It's the one that we were most familiar with at the Institute for International Economics. It's the one that you're most familiar with here. The second world of economic policy is of energy. And what I'm going to say is that today they're on a collision course. Uh, Macroeconomic policy has been promoting growth, uh, promoting it through price stability, promoting it through uh, free trade, through the Doha round, through the previous rounds, the, the meeting that's being discussed, the trade motion uh, that's being discussed right now uh, at Busan, and uh, through monetary policy. Uh, the energy side today is warning of resource limits, but blocking efforts to conserve. You speak of the younger uh, Koreans who don't think about the price of gasoline. You go to the United States and you see everybody driving these larger and larger SUVs. Uh, one made by Ford. Is, uh, it's called, I think, the Explorer, but we everybody who thinks about conservation calls it the Ford Valdez in honor of the Exxon ship that went aground. It just, you, know, you turn it on and it consumes a liter of gasoline before it moves. Uh, we don't care about this. And efforts by the energy policy people who warn of resource blocks, of resource limitations, sorry. But keep blocking the effort to conserve. And at the same time, the energy and environmental people, or uh, policymakers, are constructing classic trade barriers. Not tariff trade barriers, but quotas, or just absolute barriers to uh, trade. Let me give you an example. In the United States, we have imposed rules to limit the importation of product that has more than so much as 30 parts per million sulfur, 30 parts per million. Europe, in the same way, has gone to very low sulfur diesel fuel. And the United States next year will go to diesel fuel that essentially has no sulfur. Foreign refiners in Brazil, China, other areas, can't produce those products and so essentially are barred from import. That means that you have a limited supply and if one thinks of international trade theory, prices go up. It's the classic protected home market. So in the United States, gasoline prices rose all summer. We were dealing with wholesale gasolines of nearly $3 a gallon. What's that mean to Korea? Well, there's an arbitrage between products and crude. I make my living working with traders in a number of the big oil companies. And that rise in gasoline prices was translated into higher crude prices. So Korea paid almost $60 a barrel for crude or less because gas our gasoline bought prices went up. To finish the example, I'll come back to this. Following the two hurricanes, Katrina and Rita, we had a shortage of products. Gasoline prices were three dollars a gallon at wholesale, and the government temporarily suspended those import quotas. Gasoline prices are now a dollar fifty. The International Energy Agency produced a report last month, last week, that showed that while U.S. refining activity was down by a million barrels a day, uh, which would be about one and a quarter percent of world capacity. World refining capacity, OECD refining output hadn't changed on a year-to-year -year basis because other refineries had been brought back into operation, producing product that didn't quite meet our specifications. And that excluded a number of refineries in Europe. So I come back to that the trade sector in conflict, or the energy sector in conflict with the macro sector, essentially is creating shortages and pushing prices up. Well, the collision is going to have to be arbitrated. 
at the Federal Reserve Board and at central banks around the world by either allowing double-digit inflation or forcing a recession. And I'll start by noting that the last three major economic recessions occurred because energy prices increased and because central banks intervened to prevent the, the prices from going up. In 1973, uh, the central banks squeezed money supply and uh, Arthur Burns was chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. The price increases occurred at the time when uh, we were fighting higher prices anyway in the United States. And uh, you know, we had price controls. So what happened is, for the fourth quarter of 1973 to the fourth quarter of 1974, GDP dropped by 5% one of the largest post-war declines in GDP. Now let me add, we didn't see that coming. I was a young economist at the time working with Otto Eckstein in a little company called Data Resources. We were forecasting. And we, along with everyone else, thought the economy would weather the price increase. In the December 73 quarter, the consensus of economists was we'd see 2% growth. As late as August 1974, just before the fourth quarter of 1974, we projected 1% decline, and it came in at 6. Housing prices fell by half. We had a serious recession. In 1979 and 1980, Paul Volcker famously raised interest rates to 20% at the time of those Shaw's fall and we had a serious recession, and uh, oil prices fell from 38 to 10. My concern is that if we don't do something to deal with these trade barriers and other restrictions being imposed by the, uh, by the energy side in the short term, and we don't move quickly in the longer term to conserve, the Federal Reserve Board is going to be forced to take the same step. The, uh, let me start by talking uh, about the energy problem. Preface on energy constraints. Uh, recently, Paul Roberts published a book entitled Running on Empty, and Matthew Simmons published a book, Twilight in the Desert. Both foresee declines in global oil supply. And Simmons has gone as far as to say he thinks we will see oil prices of $160 a barrel next year. They closed at $57 tonight. But it's more. So, triple. And I don't agree, but I set that up as a, as a standard. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, the same time, central banks, particularly with the uh, the uh, ending of the 18-year period of Alan Greenspan's leadership of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, everybody on the macro side is very sanguine. We see declining inflation. We see three percent growth next year. And that is predicated, if you read the Federal Reserve Board forecasts and other forecasts, on an oil price that goes to about 50 or maybe 45. Uh, so, you know, the Federal Reserve Board today, he is relaxed. There is no concern. Uh, I, uh, I'm think, I was thinking of I'm thinking about uh, Korean analogies. I read some Korean history flying here, and I uh, recall that. Uh, your country had done a little to defend itself before the Japanese invasion when they were attempting to invade China. And they just kind of swept in uh, in about three or four weeks. The central bankers today are, are, are have the same relaxed attitude uh, towards, uh, towards the potential for coming oil inflation. Uh, the, uh, you know, they, for years, they have been worried about neighbors. 
That's not the former industry, Indian Premier, but the non-accelerating rate of unemployment. We call it the Phillips curve. And the central banks look at unemployment rates and they say, uh, if unemployment gets down, used to say, if unemployment gets down to about 4%, inflation will start. So central banks really started to tighten focusing on unemployment. Uh, in 1980, at the end of the Carter administration, when we had the serious inflationary problem, Nehru was thought to be around 65 to 7%. That is, if the economy got much lower than that, we, inflation would start. Today, it's now down to less than 4%, maybe less than 3%. Why? Well, labor lost market power. Even as oil prices are rising in the United States today, auto workers are being forced to take wage cuts. Even as oil prices rise, airline workers are being forced to take wage cuts. Labor has no power. And it has no power for three reasons. Trade, we've opened our markets to China, we've opened our markets to Korea. Other countries have done the same thing. So across the world, labor is losing market power. Second, deregulation. All airline labor used to be able to negotiate higher wages. The airlines would pass on the prices because the whole international airline system and domestics were all regulated. You couldn't enter. Well, we have entry now. Uh, I did my PhD thesis on airlines. It's easy now to create an airline. It's a great way to lose money, too. Uh, I'll tell you from personal experience. Uh, third, IT, information technology. The great the introduction of the new uh, uh, technology systems has permitted firms like Walmart to drive costs down through inventory management, ordering, just in time ordering, and so that the whole system has working against inflation. And because we have inflation tamed, the Federal Reserve Board has been able to ignore the rise of oil prices over the last five years. Uh, if you think about it, oil, when oil prices started to rise from $10 in March 99, they got to $40 about two years ago, and the central banks did nothing. Had Paul Vol if we'd been in the Volcker times, interest rates would have started going up. This time, interest rates went down because the Federal Reserve Board under Ben Bernanke was very concerned about deflation. Technology, free trade, and deregulation were driving co other costs, core inflation, down. So oil, pri oil prices were permitted to rise. That drop in interest rates from 2001 to 2004, the short-term rate went from 3% to half a percent. So if you looked at the forward curve, I mean, you could borrow at less than 1% and lend at 3%. That's nirvana for bankers. Uh, and uh, that fueled the housing boom. That led to rise in housing values. That allowed consumers to tap the increased equity from their houses, which contributed 6% to consumption, and really led to a consumption boom and the world growth. Um, now, the problem as we look forward is that the Fed has to raise interest rates, really cutting back the, uh, the refinancing of homes, stopping the rise in home equity values, and cutting consumption. But even with that, those adjustments, most people are projecting 3% growth for the U.S. economy, 3.25% growth for the global economy next year. Well, here's the problem. 3% growth in the economy will require more energy, more oil, more natural gas, and uh, you know, more coal. Just leave coal aside. But at least in the case of the United States, we're in a situation where there's going to be less gas, there's going to be less gasoline, there's going to be less diesel. As the economy is shifting to the right, the supply curve is gradually shifting to the left. And uh, I often give talks to people who say, well, I forgot, you know, it's been a long time since I studied economics. The supply curve is shifting to the left is something that I remember. That means prices have to go up. Here's the second problem. 
the price elasticity of energy demand in every country in the world is much smaller than the income elasticity. So if income goes up by 2%, 3%, you need probably 2% more petroleum, even if you're more efficient. And the, the, the elasticity says you need 2% more than you would if there was no growth. To stop, to snuff out that 2% growth in consumption, you need, say, a 6% or a 7% or an 8% increase in retail prices. And so prices have to go up next year. Uh, and when prices, when you're at the limits of supply, you don't get an 8% price increase. You get some days a 0% and some days a 50%. Now, in the United States, we have two added problems. One's caused by Mother Nature. You've seen the pic pictures of the devastation of New Orleans. Uh, you haven't seen the devastation of the natural gas system. We use, for every barrel of oil, we use half a barrel equivalent of natural gas. And we lost 5% of our natural gas supply following those hurricanes. And it's gone until next year. What happened was platforms out in the Gulf of Mexico were destroyed. There was one Korean-built huge platform that one of my former students uh, over, uh, oversaw uh, for BP that almost sank, $2 billion. They managed to get that right. Chevron lost another one. But the supply structure has been hurt. It's going to be some time before that's brought back. And they were just repairing the infrastructure that was damaged in 2004 by Hurricane Ivan. Now, the, there is one thing to think about next year. Economists are terrible forecasts, but I have it on very high authority that there will be a hurricane season next year. And uh, because there is one every year. And these tend to run in 30-year cycles, and we will likely have some hurricane damage in the Gulf of Mexico next year. So we may well lose more natural gas next year. <coughs> uh, what this means is quite high prices for heating, high, higher and higher prices for, for electricity, and higher and higher prices uh, for chemicals. Now, some of our chemical industry is going to move, no doubt, uh, here. Some will move, a lot will move to Saudi Arabia, which in December will join the World Trade Organization, and where natural gas is much less expensive. Uh, but the problem is we are going to have higher gas prices. And you will have higher gas prices because we're joining, we're now competing in the LNG markets. And so we will be bidding up spot LNG, and that, which is not moving on long-term contracts, will tend to go to the United States or to Europe. This is, we're all getting tied together on the natural gas side. On the oil side, we lost some refining capacity. Uh, that will be repaired. But next year, we will lose refineries because other refineries that were supposed to be shut down for maintenance were not. And those refineries will have to be shut down next year on a planned schedule, or they'll shut themselves down uh, in a very uh, disastrous, unplanned way. You know, if you, I spent uh, my youth working in refineries while I was going to college, your fear is that you saw the pictures of that horrible explosion in China. Uh, most often, that doesn't kill them. We don't have many people killed, but you can lose capacity for a, serial, for a period of time. So we have these natural supply constraints due to the hurricanes and due to the fact that we really did build enough infrastructure in the United States. Uh, the, you know, the, for the last 15 years, uh, the oil industry has not expanded refining capacity the way they should have. Why? Returns were low, were poor, and so the refinery firms tended to put money into exploration. Uh, also because the, uh, uh, our merger policy in the United States with the creation of ExxonMobil and Chevron Texaco forced companies and, uh, and ConocoPhillips forced companies to divest refineries so smaller firms would buy them and those smaller firms didn't have the capital to expand them. Uh, in addition, refiners 
we're forced to spend very large sums of money to produce cleaner products. We have a war in the United States between the auto industry and the oil industry. Uh, if you grew up, I grew up in Southern California, fourth generation California, and when I grew up there was a brown cloud over Los Angeles. It's gone. We produce much, we consume more gasoline, but we produce a very clean gasoline. And it's, I, I, you use, must be using a clean gasoline. I couldn't find out what you're using here, but just walking around, it's, you, it's, you don't have a smell. Go to Moscow if you want to find out, or go to Beijing if you want to find out what poor petroleum products smell like. Uh, but it costs a lot of money. So the firms invested to produce clean fuels. Now some of the investment could put, be put on the automobile. The auto industry negotiates with the EPA and the oil industry negotiates with the EPA and, e and the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, decides whether the expenditure, capital expenditure will be made by the auto industry or the oil industry and they usually pick the oil industry. Well, the oil industry actually didn't resist this. They, they, they objected in a perfunctory fashion, but instead of really fighting it, they, they, you read the quotes and people would say, you know, they're create, we're creating a, little, a world where nobody can import. China, which had built refineries and for years used to supply gasoline to the West Coast, was cut out. Now, they wouldn't be exporting anyway, given their growth. But Singapore was cut out, Brazil was cut out, Venezuela was cut out. So you limit the volumes of gasoline. And so the companies invested to make clean products, and then you know, they can make it, nobody else can, so the supply is reduced, prices are higher. Uh, some economists argue that uh, the solution to this is to uh, impose tariffs on products that don't meet environmental standards. That is, if you have gasoline that has 35 parts per million, you pay a fee. You might pay uh, you know, 10 cents a gallon or, or something like that, 2 cents a liter, which I guess would be uh, 21. Uh, you know, 21. The idea being it's enough so people will only bring products in when prices are uh, uh, when the supplies are short, prices are rising relative to the world market, but otherwise you, 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 it wouldn't come in. And this would essentially provide an, a, a, a relief valve so that prices couldn't go uh, dramatically. Uh, that policy is rejected. Every time we have gone to environmental regulators and suggested that, the environmentalists come in and say, you would, you, what you're going to do is say you can pay to pollute. How terrible. I mean, paying to pollute. I mean, you're going to... What you want to do is pay a fee and you're going to kill kids, kill little children. Is what you do. That's not happening. So we just have this absolute trade barrier. And this year, because of underinvestment, because we've had economic growth, oh, and because no, nobody has, uh, has uh, pushed fuel economy for the last 10 years, we hit the limits and gas, wholesale gasoline prices rose dramatically and retail prices uh, fall. Now, on fuel economy, I know you pushed, and you, when you were in the government, you talked about working on conservation. I was in the Carter administration working at Treasury. We passed some taxes to try to make, provide people incentives to buy fuel efficient cars. Uh, Congress had passed standards. Standards haven't been changed for 30 years. Had we kept on the improvement, improved fuel economy trend that we were on coming out of the Carter administration, which continued through 1990, we would be consuming about 15% less motor fuels today uh, than we are. Uh, mm -hmm. We would not, you know, the fuel consumption would be down. Uh, given capacity, we would be dealing with lower gasoline prices and lower crude prices. Now, there's an additional problem that comes out of Europe. The Europeans have followed a policy of providing a tax incentive to buy diesel cars. Most of us have been to Europe, and you know that if, if you rent a car or you drive in Europe, everybody uses low diesel fuel. Diesel fuel. Well, again, we get into the capacity issue and the uh, uh, the problem of uh, the investment uh, of regulation. First, 
on environmental regulations, the Europeans this year insisted that uh, diesel fuel sulfur be cut, I think, to 30 parts per million, and maybe 20 parts per million. And the European diesel is fine. It means you don't have any diesel smells in the city, any sulfur smells. But it cuts out imports from Russia. Russia has a number of older refineries. They can't make local, high-quality diesel fuel, so it doesn't come in. Diesel prices have gone up. At the same time, it has suddenly dawned on European governments that the refining industry hasn't invested in capacity to make clean diesel. They are short 10 refineries. And there's no place else to find the diesel fuel, so suddenly diesel fuel prices are going up dramatically in Europe, and they're facing high prices there. Again, it works its way through the consumer price index, and it creates problems for the European Central Bank, which is trying to create a stable currency. So you take Europe and the United States, we have these trade barriers, and prices are going up. <laughs> Next year, the situation is going to get even worse because the United States is moving to a very clean diesel, but the engineers in the oil industry are not sure they can move through the pipeline structure, and we move most of our products through pipes, to get to the retail outlets. Uh, you know, they, they set some standards out of the refinery for essentially zero sulfur diesel, hoping that maybe it can get to the get to consumers with, with the uh, required sulfur level or lower. The problem being you ship different products and pipelines and jet fuel has a high sulfur content, it has to have a side high sulfur content because the sulfur lubricates the jet engines. If you don't lubricate the jet engines, unfortunate things happen in the middle of the flight. Uh, so it's this almost unreasonable uh, region. We're, we have faced the potential of shortages of diesel fuel, which would have knock-on effects for world trade because we move most of the goods we buy by truck in the United States, as, as I think you do here. In addition, the new energy bill re essentially reduces the supply of gasoline by 2%. So next May, U.S. domestically produced gasoline is going to decline by 2%, where there should be about a 2% growth. We add all this up, and it leads to a situation where you're talking about dramatic price increases for energy. And uh, you know, I've gone through a lot of technical reasons. The reason is I want to emphasize the point that we've built this foundation for much higher energy prices very well. This is not built on sand. We have really set ourselves up for much higher energy prices. It's insane, but we have. And this is going to work through to the consumer pricing. And this is going to work through to the other measures of inflation. And in fact, I did a little study recently examining the errors of forecasting of CPI by, the, by macro forecasters. What you find over the last 10 years is that there is a very close correlation between the forecasting error of a one year ahead for, of inflation rate and the error on their assumption about oil prices. So that right now, to give you an example, they, uh, the, the uh, forecasters project inflation rates, CPI, of something like 2.5% for the fourth quarter next year. If you look at the oil, and that's predicated on a $50 oil price. Well, if you look at how crude prices are going to come out, if product prices go up, the inflation rate's going to be closer to 5.5%. And 5.5% is a high enough rate that it's going to catch Ben Bernanke's attention and it's going to catch the Federal Reserve Board's attention. Because by then they're going to be looking at a situation where energy is not transitory, but energy prices are rising, and they're going to actually recall those forecasts of Matt Simmons about $160 oil. And they're going to recall and they're going to be reminded the fact that we have these tight natural gas supplies. And they may be worried about hurricanes. What this leads me to is, is to conclude that the, the federal central banks are now, within the next year, going to be forced to take action to slow economic growth because of energy, just as they did in 1973 and just as they did in 1979 and 1990. And so that we are going to get the fourth energy recession. As I'll recall from the kind of the beginning of my talk, 
1973, nobody thought that there would be a recession in the fourth quarter of 74. The fourth quarter, the growth of the fourth quarter of 1974 would be minus 5 percent as compared to growth in the fourth quarter of 1973. What I didn't tell you was the reason, the entire reason for that, is that when the forecasts were made in 1973, people foresaw 4 percent inflation and actual inflation was 12 percent. And so the inflationary pressure is going to be such that the, uh, that the Fed is going to be required to really squeeze. Now, it's avoidable. As I said, we relaxed these import regulations following the hurricanes. The Environmental Protection Agency in the United States is allowed to grant 20-day waivers. At the same time, the IEA released product stocks to the United States, which offset the loss of gasoline and diesel production. So we essentially, we tapped the IEA, which we've all been working with for 30 years, and that helped. Gasoline prices fell by 50%, from $3 to $1.50. Crude prices fell from 70 to 57, and they're going down. Uh, natural gas prices fell because we've had warm weather. Heating oil prices fell because we had warm weather. And right now we're at, actually, we were in Chicago two weeks ago. I was talking, uh, we're, we're trying, this trip started in Oklahoma City, worked to Chicago, worked to London. In Chicago, they had 70 degree weather. They closed the golf courses on October 31st. Let me tell you, the golf courses there look beautifully and they look forlorn. It was 70 degrees. It was a great day to go out and play golf uh, in summer attire. Minnesota, in terms of degree days, the way one measures weather, Normally you expect 700 degree days by this time, they get about 4,000 in a year, had had 300. It had been really warm, but it's changed. And one of the things, people, the weather forecasters, uh, who seem to do a better job than the economists are telling us, is it's going to be cold this winter. Cold winter in the North United States is going to lead to much higher, much, much higher prices. And it will have lead to high gasoline prices in the summer because you can't build inventories. Europe's been warm, but the European forecasters are predicting very cold winter. They're predicting shortages of natural gas in England for industrial users. So we're going to see much higher energy prices in Europe, much higher prices in uh, in the United States if the weather forecasters are right. All of that puts pressure. Some of the pressure can be mitigated by changes in environmental regulations. Temporary. And the way I think the way to, to achieve that, having tried to negotiate with environmental uh, negotiators over the years, is to go and say, look, we will, in exchange for short-term uh, fees on imported products, what we, what, we will, what we ought to do is go start taking some serious steps towards conservation, which we haven't taken in the United States. I gather you haven't taken enough steps here yet. And move ahead. But uh, I am very worried that uh, we won't do that. Instead, we'll have a recession. Now, the good news from the recession is that it'll get us much lower oil prices. Much, much lower oil prices. Because uh, given the commodity market structure right now, once prices start to fall, the refining constraints go away, the natural gas becomes available, and then every prices begin to come down in a classic commodity market spiral. If you read today's headlines, there's a story about copper in China. There was a story about copper in China in 1976 when uh, Mr. Hamanaka and Sumitomo failed, and copper prices declined by 50 percent. So we could, we could see much, much lower prices uh, once the economy slows down. Now, Saudi Arabia could cut production to try to stop that. But one of, the, one of the things is the way the markets are structured right now, prices will fall dramatically due to financial engineering. Derivative, energy derivative products will put huge downward pressures. That's a heck of a price to pay. A recession is a heck of a way to go about getting it. Uh, and so that leads to the kind of the conclusion that you know we have ourselves in a, a very tough situation with uh, setting ourselves up where the central banks are going to be forced to act uh, and that uh, uh, we really have to take a recession to moderate energy prices. Now, the, I think 
Let me conclude by talking about what I think Ray Bernanke's concern is, that if we take a recession, the core rate of inflation falls below zero, we actually start having falling prices, and the United States would slide into a deflationary cycle like that experienced by Japan uh, from 1990 to about 2003, 2004. Uh, from an energy perspective, that would be good because if, if we slow down, by the time we come out of it, we'll be using, we'll have cut our oil use dramatically. The U.S. does have, uh, have alternative fuels such as ethanol, and we could, we can and will shift to using uh, biofuels for, say, a third uh, of our fuel supply. And uh, at one meeting at the Institute for International Economics, uh, it, we, at the time of a recent WTO discussion, we realized that it would, it's possible to resolve a WTO dispute with Brazil over uh, cotton uh, by essentially shifting half our fuel to a, an ethanol that's based on poplar trees and, 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 and essentially going to an, an extreme biofuel solution. Uh, GM, is des which is desperately trying to survive, is pushing that. Uh, if, uh, if we were to go, to go into a period of slow growth, this would bring a, you know, we would begin to see this penetration of biofuels and our, our dependency on Middle Eastern oil might, be, might fall from uh, 10 million barrels a day to 8 million barrels a day. We've seen changes like that in the past and it's quite possible we could see a change in the future. But the primary message is that our energy policy is, energy policy in the United States, energy policy in Europe right now is in direct up collision course with monetary policy. And the monetary policy is going to be forced to change given these constraints on refining products in the, uh, uh, both in Europe and the United States and given the constraint on refined products uh, in, uh, in Europe. The, there's really not much way out of it. Unless we decide to move to a more uh, rapid period of inflation, we raise the money supply. And that has other implications in terms of the exchange rate of the dollar, mon international monetary stability. So I don't think we see that. Let me stop and uh, be happy to take questions. Thank you. Amen.